Good afternoon, everyone. Hey, good afternoon. We'll give it a couple more minutes and see if others join in. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. So today we are going to talk about how to use asynchronous instruction in an online course. So this course actually talks more about the importance of asynchronous instruction. And then it actually goes into some of the different tools that you can use in Canvas that can help you with asynchronous instruction in your online courses. And then I'll, I will allow times, time for us to talk about some of your own individual um, courses and some suggestions that I can give to help you make some of your activities asynchronous rather than synchronous. So the first thing I want to do is go over our outcomes. Let me make sure I got everybody in here. Okay, so um, the learning outcomes for this course are upon completion, you will be able to understand the importance and relevance of asynchronous instruction in the pedagogy of online learning, apply principles of asynchronous instruction to courses, and then begin planning on developing types of asynchronous learning activities for your students in your online course. So I want to start out with just a quick knowledge check. Um, it's a true false. And um, I was going to insert a poll, but I just got off another Zoom meeting, so I did not get to put the poll in. But we'll just, you can use, everybody know where the thumbs up feature is on your, on Zoom. You can answer by doing thumbs up if you agree. So the first one is the following items are the same. Learning activity, assignment, and assessment. Is that true or false? If you think it's true, put a thumbs up. If you think it's false, don't put anything. Okay. The next one says, for an online course, it is always important for students to see the instructor. Example, Zoom, Big Blue Button, or Skype. It is always important for the student to see the instructor. And then the last one, in an online setting, students are not independent enough to only follow learning modules without a full lecture. True or false? If you think it's true, put a thumbs up. If you think it's false, nothing. All right, looks like everybody said that they were false, and that is correct, because none of these are true. Number one, a learning activity is the process by which you teach your content. The assignment is their way of showing you that they know your content. And then the assessment is the way that you gauge their grading for that content to complete a learning activity. So those are all not the same. And then online courses, it is, it is important for the student to see the instructor, but what was the, the word that threw it off? That made it false? What word was in there? Always. Always. You don't always have to be in front of your student in an online class to know that they are learning or that you are teaching. Um, it's good for them to see you occasionally, but not always. And then the third one, um, students are independent. Surprisingly, research shows that 
students learn significantly better in online courses many times than in a traditional course. Now that doesn't always apply to every student, but there is a huge number of students where online learning is most effective for them for whatever reasons, but we won't get into the pedagogy of it. Just wanted to do a quick knowledge check. Any questions about that knowledge check before I go into the actual session? Okay. So what is the difference between asynchronous and synchronous learning? So synchronous learning is what we always did in traditional courses and just minus the distance part. We met our students, they came into our classes, they had a seat, we taught them, they learned, we assessed them, they moved on. It all happened in real time. Well, in an online setting, it's the same thing pretty much, but we are putting a mechanism or a tool in front of us for that real time to happen, which can be via Zoom, Skype, or Big Blue Button or other video formats. So it means we are sometimes mimicking what we did in a traditional class in an online setting, synchronous. Now, asynchronous means that learning is still occurring. However, we are channeling that online learning through different tools that do not have to be in real time. Asynchronous learning allows students to access the course at any time, any place, and at their leisure or at their convenience. That's why so many online universities, those big box universities like University of Phoenix and Northwestern, they have like 150,000 students worldwide because they're allowing their students to access their learning at any time. It doesn't necessarily have to be from 2 to 2.50 on Tuesday, Thursday. They can actually pull it up at any point in time during the day, 3 a.m. in the morning when we're all asleep, or hopefully we're all asleep. Um, those things can happen through the use of learning modules, discussion boards, pre-recorded videos. So students can still, still see your face, but it doesn't necessarily have to be real time. You can pre-record lectures. You can pre-record instructions and directions to students. And then, of course, collaborative groups. And there are many more, but we won't be able to get into every single one of them today. So learning can take place, a little diagram here, you know, all the different directions. Learning can take place in any way or format. This slide I try to include on all of my, all of my sessions because I am a big believer in learning styles. I personally am an auditory learner. I can tune out and actually look away and look out the window. But if I hear what you're saying, I'm going to pick it up. Not every student is like that. Some students are visual and some are kinesthetic. But one of the good things about online learning, it allows us to be able to tap into all of those learning styles, just as we would in a traditional setting. So it is important to keep those things in mind. So if I am lecturing for an hour on Zoom, and then I, and then I want my students to tune in at two o'clock for my 50 minute lecture, if they aren't an auditory learner, they're sitting there looking at the screen, or if they're not a visual learner, maybe you have some type, type of PowerPoint they may not get that lecture, but if I have other different avenues that they can pick up on my content in my learning module, then that's going to tap into those learners who have different styles. So now I want to go into Canvas and just show you some of the asynchronous tools that you can use in your Canvas courses. And then, like I said, we'll spend the bulk of the time just talking individually about content that can actually cross over to different areas and disciplines and see what I can help each of you with. So I'm going to go now to my Canvas shell. Do you have any questions about the slides that I shared? Um, yeah, I, I pointed out, Demo, we also always been doing asynchronous education as well. We just may not have realized it when we assign readings and we assign people to do things outside of class. Absolutely, absolutely. 
So we probably did that in our traditional classes. It just seems a little unorthodox when we take everything online. For some reason, we have this visual that online means they have to see me online. But some of the asynchronous things that you did in a traditional classroom cross right over into online learning. Great point. All right, so uh, Dr. Zagros, I still have your module we created. So we're gonna look at your module we created in the other course and uh, talk about some of the different tools that Canvas have to do asynchronous. So let's say that you truly want to lecture your students. You have to get at least 15, 20 minutes of content out, which I know there are disciplines where lecturing are very, is very important. So you don't necessarily have to do it real time. I'm going to show you some different ways that you can to do that lecture without having to be on Zoom or Big Blue Button at a specific time. So how many of you, first one is gonna be a really simple one. How many of you have a smartphone? Okay, so anybody ever videoed anything on a smartphone? Say, let's say a birthday party or even um, an event or you want it to like get a live on social media. This is the same concept. You can take your smartphone and you can actually video yourself, save the file, and then upload it into Canvas. And I'll show you how you do that. So I'm just going to use this particular module, for example, and I'm going to add, and I'm going to do it as a page. And then I can say, this is a video lecture. And I'm going to show you how you can do it within Canvas as well. But this is the most simple way for those who may not be comfortable with Canvas yet. But we're all comfortable with our smartphones, right? So with everything in the module, when we add it, it always goes to the bottom. So I'm just going to pull it up here. So. If I wanted to add my video lecture, remember nothing is really built in Canvas until we build it, so it's nothing there yet. So if I open up the page, then if I were to click this button where it says insert media, I can actually, once I've saved my, excuse me, let me go to this one, wrong one. In record upload media, I can pull myself up and record, but assuming I've saved this already, I'm going to upload my media. I'm going to go and select that file. So where I saved my video file, I can actually go in, and I don't have any videos in here, I could actually go in here and click it, and it would embed here into this page. So now I have an actual video lecture that would look something like, let me show you one that's already. Completed. So here is some video content. That's not, not a lecture. But this is what your video would actually look like. It wouldn't be a YouTube, but it would be you talking to your students where when they click it, then they would actually hear you talking, not Journey singing, in that particular page. So that's just really simple. You take your smartphone, you record yourself, you save it. You'll have to email it to yourself unless you have Mac products. I'm not team Mac, um, I'm team Droid you can actually um, Dropbox it or drop, airdrop it into your Mac. And then you just simply upload it using the media file. Now that same media file, I want to show you again, how you can use Canvas to upload a pre-recorded video. So if I go to add, I'm going to add a page, new page, Add the item, everything always goes to the bottom in Canvas, so we have to pull it wherever we want it, whether it's at the top or in the middle. 
So nothing in Canvas is really built until we build it. So now here's our video lecture. Now we need to go to edit and build it. Now here's how we can do that same video concept, not with the smartphone this time, but with an actual camera. If you have a webcam on your laptop or a webcam on your desktop, you can do this within Canvas. So I'm going back to that same record, upload media. Notice the camera pops up. I can actually start recording here and it counts me down. And as I'm recording my lecture, excuse my dirty office, I can record the lecture to the students and then I can say finish. And now I have my video, I save it, and my okay, laptop I'm is recording my lecture. Mine is very finicky, so I have to save mine this way. Sometimes it depends on the version of your Dell that you have. You can click save and it will automatically save, but mine is finicky, so I save it. And then I have it inside my lecture. So now when I save and publish, I have my video lecture right here for my students. And as I'm recording my lecture, excuse my dirty office, I can record the lecture to the students and then so that's using the Canvas tool, the Canvas camera or Canvas feature where you upload your video. So two different ways that you can do pre-recorded lectures right inside of Canvas. Questions? Okay, I think someone's talking, but they're muted. Unmute yourself. Did someone ask a question? I, I'll ask a question. Okay. Is, is there a, um, a value for doing it in Zoom as opposed to doing it in one of the other platforms that are out there? Um, no, that's the next one I was gonna show Dr. Zubob is Zoom. Okay. We could actually, I won't go into Zoom itself, but you guys, many of you have taken Zoom um, right. trainings. So you can record your lecture in Zoom as Dr. Zubob stated, save it, it actually saves in the cloud or you can save it on your um, device. If you start doing a lot of them, I suggest save it in the cloud because it will take up a lot of space. But um, once you've saved it, you can actually do the same and it's the same process where we would go into our video lecture. Let me reduce this. Go into our video lecture, edit. And then you would actually go and choose the video from wherever you saved it, whether it's on your desktop or on the cloud. So same concept, Dr. Zubov just introduced us a new way, our third way of pre-recording a video lecture. So now we have three ways. Thank you. Other questions, comment. And then one, one more then. And, and is, is Zoom better than Panato or? You know, what are the what are the advantages of one over the other? Do you know? It's kind of like that argument of do you uh, like domestic or import? Um, they're the same. They do yeah. essentially the same things. Mm -hmm. I prefer and these are my choices. I like to use the canvas tools to record. I like using my smartphone to record. I like using screencast o matic and then zoom and and Panato come in kind of a last place for me. But then oh. I have colleagues who have the reverse. So mm -hmm. it's really a preference. And usually it's what you get used to. Um, mm -hmm. Find that one that works for you mm -hmm. and you use it. And it's okay. okay because the students don't know, oh, wow, she's pre-recording in Zoom all the time. They just see a recording. They don't know. Okay. Other questions? All right. So now I want to move on to some other asynchronous tools. Are there any questions about pre-recorded videos. You have at least three ways now that you can do pre-recorded lectures. Asynchronous. Dr. White, will you be sending us the, these instructions? 
Yes, I will. And in fact, all of them, um, if you have not accepted our online course, everything that we teach is inside of that course. So yes, um, I will send you the links to that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so we can move on now. Next thing I want to show you is just the module concept. And I won't go into creating modules because that is a separate course, but I just want to show you the concept of using modules and how that can be asynchronously a learning activity for students and it's proven effective. So if you know on your Canvas navigation tool, we have the selection of modules. A lot of people make that inactive because they feel like, okay, I have assignments, I have grades, I have everything I need already. I really don't need the module, but modules are a lifesaver. Um, I love modules and students love modules because it synchronizes their learning in the, in the sequence that you want them to have as they learn your content. So I'm going to drop down to this particular module um, that we built in one of my courses. It's called Exploring the Flute. One of the music faculty helped build it. So in this, we have different learning activities going on. So the first activity is, of course, we always want to start with our outcomes. Um, so students know what the intent of this learning lesson or theme or chapter, what our outcomes are. Then as a student clicks through with the next, or if they want to go back, oh, I can't remember what we were supposed to learn. Okay, let me read that again. I can click previous, but this allows them to pro uh, progress through your learning activities in the sequence you would like. So the first thing is read chapter 22. And the chapter name is Woodwind Types to Flute. Now, would you say that is a synchronous or asynchronous activity? Asynchronous. It's definitely asynchronous. And how many times have we done that in class where we've assigned a reading? Uh, we wouldn't necessarily always read a chapter in the class. So they are already doing asynchronous activities before they got online. So this is their first learning activity. The next thing is many of us use PowerPoints in our traditional classes. Well, you can still use them in an online class. So now here's a PowerPoint on the history of the flu where the student can actually go through what you would have normally gone over in class now, this one has no sound to it. It's just a regular PowerPoint. However, I can actually make it interactive with several different things, several different tools that we have. I can make it interactive with Panapto. I can use um, Screencast-O-Matic. I can use PlayPosit. There are so many things that we can use to make it more than just a PowerPoint because we are always concerned about our students not reading everything, which sometimes I don't read everything, I'll be honest, I'll skim through. Um, so if we want to make it interactive, we can use Panapto Recordings, which is already integrated into your Canvas site. And that goes back to what Dr. Zuba said, if you don't like Panapto, then choose the format that works best for you. You don't have to use every tool. I don't use every tool. I know about them, but I don't know how to use all of them. So it's okay if, you know, you heard about a tool and you think, well, I'm not using that. It's okay. Whatever you're using, if it's effective for your students and they're learning and their grades are looking great, then keep using it. So Panapto is a choice. Zoom is a choice. Screencast-O-Matic is a choice. So they can actually go through your PowerPoint. This is only three slides just for presentation purposes. But once they finish that PowerPoint, then they're able to go to next. Well, many times in our traditional classes, we have supplemental information. So sometimes that supplemental information may be in the form of a website. So here's some information on the flu that maybe in your class, you would have put them in groups to read and share, or maybe they would do it individually. You can do that same thing online. You can put the website out here, and then you can put them into collaborative groups and say in your groups, talk about some of the key historical features in the development of the flute. So as they read through this particular website, 
they are able to, to take notes, work in their groups, and then do some of the same things that you would have done in your traditional. And it's asynchronous because in their groups, they're actually contributing at their own time. They're not necessarily in your classroom in a little circle working. So you still have learning taking place. So now they've done that. Let's go to our next learning activity. So here's another, whoa, there's a video. That's so well, there's a commercial. So in your video, I don't have the um, non-commercial version of YouTube, so my apologies. I suggest if you use a lot of YouTube videos, uh, upgrade to the premium so there's no commercial commercials. But when you post your- um, that, that, won't, that won't work always. Just so you know, the non it, it will only work for your item, but if it goes, if it's, if it's not broadcast from your account directly, they will still get a, they will still get a commercial. Yes. So if, say I had premium, if I uploaded this as premium, they're going to get what I upload. Now, if they go to it from a link on their own, you're right. They will get the commercials. But if I upload it from my premium with no commercials, but I don't have premium, um, then they should not get the commercials. That's the whole purpose of premium. So they don't get any of the ads. Um, that I'm just telling you, it doesn't work quite that way. I have YouTube Premium, uh -huh. and it works that way if I'm broadcasting. If I am broadcasting, um, you know, synchronously, but once I send it out, it actually becomes a link. They're not on my account. That's why they will see the commercial. Okay, just I've never had that happen with mine because I do it actually for um, my because I do a lot with my church with Sunday school, and I send my links out, and I don't want something crazy to come through. For church so I've never had anything happen but thanks that's good to know so once you have your video in here now they can actually play that video at their own time they don't have to be there with you um, it can be 4 a.m. in the morning where we're nice and sleep and they're up most of the time they can watch that video and still learn I didn't mean to stop sharing I was trying to click out of that okay so now they're going through the video. Now we have an assessment or a quick check, a formative assessment, because I like to think of discussion boards as a quick way to um, informally check to see if my students are, are learning. So discussion boards leads us to our third form of asynchronous instruction, which is the discussion board. And that is also an option. I actually disabled it, but you could have it on your, on your desktop. I disabled it, and let me tell you why, because I use modules. So I don't want just discussion boards sitting over here, because I know that in their module, if I use it, they're going to still get that discussion board. So here's a discussion board that says, discuss the evolution of the flu over time. You must resp your response must be two paragraphs and linked to one source you must reply to at least three classmates. This is due by and the due date. So now students can reply to this discussion board. When they click on it, they can send their re reply. And I have my discussion board set up and these are all choices inside of whenever we, when I show you this, you can decide what, what kinds of parameters you want on your discussion board. But I always make sure that students have to post before they see other people's postings because we know that sometimes if yours looks really good and I don't know what to say, guess what I'm going to do? I might take a little bit from yours. So we don't want that happening with students. So I always set it up that they cannot see anything until they post their own. And then once they posted that, they actually can start responding to their classmates. What do we have going on? Learning, we have collaboration, we have dialogue, we have interaction. Anything that would have happened in your classroom traditionally in a group or in a discussion, or if you pose a question out at the beginning of class, you have the same learning taking place online. So let's see how we make that discussion board inside of 
our module. So if I were to go to add, here it is, discussion. So I click on discussion. The next window says select a topic. So we're just going to say the flu. I'm going to add that. Remember, it always goes to the bottom. So I bring it to wherever I choose it to be on my in my module. Nothing in Canvas is built until we build it. So there's nothing in the discussion board. Just because I selected discussion, it doesn't poof, create one for me. I have to build it. So now I click edit so I can start building. I type out the question that I want them to do. I tell them how the rules are that they need to post first, respond to two students, and that it is due on whatever day. And then here are those defaults I was telling you about. So if you, let's say you have a document that you want them to discuss or a, a graphic or a chart or JPEG or even a PowerPoint, you can actually upload that here. So anything that you have say the video, you can attach it to this discussion board as well. So you have that option. Then here are some other options. Allow threaded replies. That's just an aesthetic thing. If you want it to um, come in and out in the thread to see who said what, which is usually good, click that one. Um, this one you definitely want to pick. Users must post before seeing replies. Um, you can also enable a podcast feed so that they can actually hear the discussion in a podcast format. You can um, allow student replies in the podcast. I wouldn't suggest that until you vet those. And then, of course, if you're grading this discussion board, you click grade it. You can allow liking, which is a social media tool that students enjoy having. And then you can even add it to your student to-do list, which takes it straight to their calendar, which I do highly suggest. Whenever you do a discussion board and whenever the due date is, you can actually just default in. You need to have this discussion board done by this date. So I put it inside of their text so they can see it. Then I also put it on their calendar because there's no rule to, to say that students can't see things two and three times online because that actually helps them remember it. If it's a group discussion, you would check here and set it up as groups. If you want to have a time frame on this, say it's this week, the 13th, and it ends on the 17th, you can do that. And then you save and publish it. And then there it is, your discussion board. And your students can do exactly as I showed you earlier by going in and replying to you and themselves. So that is yet another asynchronous tool. It's one of my favorites. Um, discussion boards are probably the closest thing to mimicking what happens in a traditional class asynchronously. Questions about discussion boards? Okay, so now I want to show you a couple other tools and then we're going to talk about um, some things that you do in your classes and where they might fit in asynchronously. So the last thing I want to show you, going back to modules, Oh, this is Jill real quick. Hey, everybody. Hey. Hi. I just wanted to know, um, will this be available after? Because I had to jump on in the middle. So yes. will this be available for me to watch um, afterwards? Yes, it will be. Yes. Okay. I just find it in my Canvas learning. I'm actually going to email you the, um, the video recording of the Zoom session. But um, any of the directions on like how to do discussion board, modules they're all inside the canvas course okay that works thanks you're welcome and i saw yeah. someone pop up on chat i mean isn't it kind of ironic that we're doing this synchronously to learn asynchronous work yeah but guess what we city has you covered because we have an asynchronous course that covers all this so you can actually go back into the course and see some of the same things asynchronously all right so the last thing I wanted to show you were collaborative groups. And 
and I may have disabled groups on this. Oh, here it is. Okay, so if you wanted to create, let's say, um, groups within your class, the link called people, this does several things. Um, it allows you to one, see who's in your class. You can see when they last accessed it. You can even see how much activity they have had in that course. So let's say you have a student who emailed you and said, I have no clue what's going on in this class. I've been in there and I, I, I just don't get it. And you say, well, you've been in there. So you can actually go and see it if they have zero activity, then you know they have not been in the course at all. So that's one thing you can see in people. You can use people to take your attendance. You can actually use the discussion board to take your attendance as well. Um, these are all asynchronous tools that you can use for attendance. So within the week, like my latest activity was today. So if your week was the 13th through the 17th, and you are telling students you have to access this class during that week for attendance, you can see, oh, well, Wanda made the cut. She accessed it at 1.35 on April 15th. So people's going to show you a lot of things. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any students in this class. Um, that's the downfall of being in city. We don't have classes, so we don't have names oftentimes in our, our teaching classes. But that's something we're going to work on next year if we have to create some some um, make-believe students and put them in our courses. But if I had a class, all of their names would show up here, going down in the row, and then again, I could see all of their activity here, or total activity. But people is also the place where we are going to create any kinds of groups. So if I click on project groups, you can assign groups several ways. So the first thing you want to do is add the group. So let's say, um, since we're talking about the flute, we're going to do the comparison of flute groups. Um, I want five students in each group. And I can actually choose, allow Canvas to build that group for me. So if I had students, when I click that, it would actually build out five students. So it would say five of five and each student's name would list there. So now I have a group, and then each group would go there. So these are how you build groups. And you can set your groups up, say, let's say you want a group for every, every lesson. That's a lot of work because you're building groups each time. A lot of people in online learning set their groups at the beginning, and those students tend to work together the entire semester. So let's say if I had a, these five students, they would work together the entire semester. That kind of mimics real life because think about it. In our teams at work or our departments, we don't really get to say, oh, I'm going to go, I'm not going to work in city this week. I'm going over here to human resources. I want that team. So pretty much this mimics real life. So they actually start to get to work together and team build and work with the same group of people over time. Will there sometimes be issues? Yes, just like in a traditional class, you may find yourself switching people out. But again, this is a great way to collaboratively work with students and again, mimic what the real world is like. Questions? So now I want to talk individually or collectively um, about different content areas or some of the things that you're doing in your class that maybe we can look at and I can show you here that can help you as well as help your colleagues because a lot of times we find that learning activities that work in one content, oh, I can do that in mine. I'll just change it to whatever. So what are some, anybody want to throw out something? that we can look at asynchronously and, and come up with a way to do that online? Um, one thing, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, Dennis Felder. Hey, Dr. Felder. Uh, here, here, here. W one thing that I have, and I like that module concept, in my classes, I, I have been using and or setting things up by assignments. Mm -hmm. And Either I use uh, assignments or discussion board. I have a discussion board 
for every week. We have 15 weeks and they have a discussion board question or scenario or whatever the case might be that they must respond to each and every week, which is a total of uh, 1,500 points because I give them a max of 10 points uh, a piece. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, 150 points anyway. And with the, uh, also I go through assignments and set up, uh, even if I'm going to do an exam and I have a weekly exam, 15 weeks, 15 exam, mm -hmm. plus the midterm plus the uh, final exam. And every exam is based upon each week or each chapter. And I have a PowerPoint that I post on the front page of the uh, of Canvas. So I think I need to change that and put it in a module concept. I think that probably would be better. Okay, so everything you mentioned are great. And does it work well for your students? Yes, it, it does, it does. Now, one thing they, they tell me is that now, for all my assignments, I indicate the due date mm -hmm. for my discussion board, all assignments. So they can't say that they don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one thing at the end, especially since everything is online now, they ask me to respond to them weekly, let them know what is going on. So I don't mind doing this since, you know, with the circumstances, but I still have it for each of the, uh, the assignment. But one problem that I've had, and it just started today, when I go to assignment or YouTube, I click on YouTube and put in the description. Mm -hmm. And then I hit enter, correct? Yes. I did that the first time it worked. Mm -hmm. Today is not working. YouTube is not working. Okay, and you're absolutely right. For some reason, and I don't know if OIT changed something, and I'm going to show everybody what you're talking about. Inside of the module, if you remember when we built the page, so inside that page, you have the option to go to YouTube itself. It is not working. You're absolutely right, Dr. Felder. So what I have been doing, like I tried it earlier, see zero results. I have been doing is just going to YouTube itself and just copy the embed link and then embed it this way. Um, excuse me, wrong one, insert media. So you embed it and you just copy the embed code here and then it does it. So um, I can send you directions on how to do that. I need to ask um, information technology if something was changed with that, because yes, you are absolutely right. We should be able to type it in and then our videos choices pop up. But it was, it was working at first. Yes. <clears throat> I would like that as well, because I, I use that same process in terms of clicking on YouTube to insert links. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Dr. Felder finishes, I have a question as well. Okay. All right. Dr. Patterson Masuka will get you next. Dr. Felder did that. Um, yes. I think your question was, should you switch to modules? That's going to be a preference. I wouldn't say do it now um, in the middle of or three weeks left in, but oh. as you build your course for summer and or fall, consider using the module concept because you have everything inclusive that would be in a module anyway. So yes. And the module could be like week one, week two, week three, week four, and et cetera. Absolutely. In fact, right down here, I'll show you. Um, these are just different ways that people, like you would label it on your syllabus. You can go week one, chapter one. If you want to title it by the theme or, or the unit, you can do that. Or you can combine the two, chapter 15, exploring the nervous system. So however you want to title it. And it helps the students. Um, package the learning experience. They actually see everything in one place for that particular learning experience. Okay. Okay. Great question, Dr. Felder. Yes, ma'am. All right, Dr. Patterson. Yes. 
Um, I have a question specifically as it relates to, well, a lot of my courses teach with the learning outcome oral communication. Yes. So typically students have to develop presentations. Mm -hmm. So I use, I will, one way that I record those videos, I use Connect with McGraw-Hill and they have a tool mm -hmm. that students can upload, you know, use videos. I also ha have students also to record on YouTube and at the top of their page, like create an outline and embed the link. So that's two ways. Um, one of the things I've talked about with Dr. Moore, because uh, some students aren't comfortable with YouTube, uh, is there another way that students can record lectures? Uh, we talked about uh, the possibility one day Winston-Salem State needs to have a server so students can upload their um, videos. We could also down the road use it as assessment. Is there any other suggestions in Canvas for students to, to create videos that I can then go back and assess? Yes, ma'am. The best tool the students have right now if their access is Adobe tools. Um, they can do um, your, their speech to you in two ways with Adobe. They can use Adobe Spark Video or they can use Adobe Rush, which is the one I would suggest because it's a little bit more sophisticated. Um, it's not hard to use. It's very seamless. Uh, students use Adobe products and even the ones who aren't using it, it's it's a quick learn for them. So even if you were to say, give them a list of options, let's say you give them YouTube, Zoom, Adobe Rush, Adobe Spark, um, and they can even use their smartphone too as well and send it to you as an MP4 file. So let's say you gave them those four choices. When they upload them into Canvas, and I'm just gonna go quickly to show you what will happen. So let's say that, um, so let's say this actually said um, speech on um, narration or narrative speech. When they upload their particular assignment, and I have to go to student view, my apologies. Let me go to student view. So when they go to their assignment, assuming this said um, narrative speech, they can actually, when they click on to submit that assignment, it may not let me, okay, there we go. So whenever they go down here, they have four ways to upload. And then you have to enable these when you set up the assignment. And I always tell faculty, because this is what I did when I taught online, I always enabled every possible way a student can upload an assignment. Why is that important? Many students don't have Microsoft Word. Many students may not have access to sophisticated files or even internet, high-speed internet to do a YouTube channel. So when I enable file, text, Dropbox, 365, I'm covering every way pretty much that they could send me something, whether it's a Google Doc or a Word document. So whenever they choose their file to upload, they actually can go to that MP file. Notice here's a file. This is a movie file. Um, they could actually click on that. It's not going to, oh, yeah, this it did. Okay, so it clicked, it adds there, and they can submit that to you. It's probably not going to go anywhere. They can submit that file to you, but you've given them about 10 choices, but whatever one they choose, because you've enabled options, when they upload it, you'll still be able to view it. And if you um, need help with Spark or Rush, we have sessions coming up on that. Um, BART typically does those, but we'll probably have a few more coming up pretty soon because we do want to encourage faculty to use those free tools. And let me just put that plug out there for Spark. Any faculty on here, if you did not know, you too have free access to all of the Adobe Creative Cloud Suite tools um, for the next two years now. We've had them for oh, since 2017, but you have access to that and you can use some of those tools too. That's another way to use some asynchronous learning activities by doing Spark slides. 
um, not necessarily having to do a PowerPoint or even doing a rush video. So that's another one, but that's a whole nother course. But um, Dr. Patterson Masuka, I hope that gave you some answers as to ways that you can get your speeches. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. And if we need to talk off run, you know, we, we're on the same team in city. <laughs> Hit me up. <laughs> other questions or other content areas that we can discuss. Thank you, uh, Dr. Patterson Masuka and Dr. Felder for sharing those examples. Let's get some other examples that may help. Dr. Zagros, give us some business um, ideas. About what, you mean? Um, and anything that we can throw into as an asynchronous learning activity. What's something that you do in your class that we can asynchronously oh. do? I make students go out and, uh, and, and write reaction, reactions to various things. Like I put up a few items of, um, uh, of articles on a particular topic. And then I make them, it's not, I tell them, don't just go out and give me a discussion. I say, you need to go out and you need to find something out there and bring it back to the, bring it back to the group. So it's not just their opinion. It's something that they're going to add to the discussion that then other people can then go ahead and learn from. Okay, absolutely. And now do you do that in a discussion board as an actual assignment or both? I, I do it. I do it as a discussion board because I want everybody to be able to see it because the assignments that they have only go to me. And so there, there's two different things that I have. I have assignments that are test questions that they, they have to respond to. And usually what I've done is I've told them, here's the discussion board. And then I have them do all this. And then I say, okay, now I want you to give me your opinion based upon not only what you thought before, but also everything you've read. And then you need to cite everybody. So you, they write a little short, short, maybe two page response that includes, includes um, information that they then linked back to the discussion board. Because one thing I've done is I've told them I don't want them responding directly to other individuals. I want them only responding to me. And that's because um, I'm employing kind of a parliamentary procedure to ensure that people don't get heated and don't, don't say something that they shouldn't when I can't monitor it. That's an excellent point. And if that's something that you see as a climate in a particular group or class, you definitely have the option to just have them respond to you. I'm glad you brought that up. I want to point out what Dr. Zagros just said about um, he allows them to attach documentation to prove what they're discussing. So this same discussion board that we created earlier, and remember we had the students go in to reply. If you require exactly what Dr. Zagros mentioned, here it is they can attach a file. So let's say you want them to show you the journal article that they got their information from. They now can attach that file. They can link, they can hyperlink into the particular document. So there are so many ways in here that you can have documentation to prove or just to build on the analytical skills of your students and not just have a basic discussion board. So that is a great way and another asynchronous way to add on to the discussion board. So they would simply attach here or if they have, if it's an online file, they can link here. And they can even link in videos to you too. Um, accommodation reasons, I love Canvas because Let's say you have a student who not necessarily can write to communicate well. Their writing is not always the best, but when they talk to you in class, they are very elaborate and they're able to communicate well. You may give that student the, op the option, since we know that you like to talk to me in class, why don't you video yourself and just send me your assignment as a video? That's perfectly okay. You're just making a slight accommodation to, to assess that student, which is, is great because that's helping that student still do well on the assignment. So Canvas allows that. Other questions? We have about five minutes. Now that would be with an attachment when they do that. Yes. And what they can do, you can give them the option to attach it using the Canvas tools here, this record upload media, because they can actually do that too on their side. Or you can just tell them, use your smartphone 
And guess what? They figure it out. They know how to do it. Yeah, they, they do. <laughs> other questions, other content areas that we can look at some asynchronous examples. Don't forget about that YouTube uh, problem. I'm going to ask um, OIT what's going on with the YouTube um, option inside of the page. Um, let me just show you quickly how you can just kind of make do until we get it fixed. So oh, let's say, one. yes, someone said something. I was just going to say you can use a link. That's usually how I do it, embed yes. a link. You can link it. Put the link in or you can just embed um, let me just go quickly we get it you don't really want your okay I hate when this pop-out window comes up. It doesn't like for me to get to my, okay, here we go. So um, you can link it in or, and this is how Dr. Zagros just mentioned it. As an external URL, of course, it didn't go through, so I'll just put www. This isn't but, a YouTube, of course, but in the essence of time. By, by the way, while you're doing that, let me, let me give a couple of ideas for you. One thing you can also do is you can go out and you can find links to allow you to download the YouTube videos. Then you can go ahead and you can edit them as you wish. And that means that you aren't going out to YouTube. You actually have an uploaded separate video. And you don't have to worry about that aspect of the of the ad showing and all of these things. Still give people credit, and et cetera, when you do that. The other, the other thing is, this happens that sometimes you have things that are behind paywalls. Again, you're going to have a problem with that because you might have access to it, but your students don't. When it's a link, they can't get into that paywall, which means you're going to have to find some way of copying the information into your, into your classroom. Now, mm -hmm. there are aspects that we have called fair use for teaching that should allow you to do this within the discussion boards since all of our all of our uh, classes exist behind uh, password protected systems so we aren't opening it up to the general public but i do have to point that out that like sometimes i've had to copy things like new york times articles because students may not have access to it that i have access to it through subscriptions that i have Absolutely, and that's a great point. And another avenue to that is our library has um, access to most um, articles like New York Times, um, Journal, Higher Ed, a lot of the articles that we pay for, or like you said, students will have to. Check also with um, your content area librarian. They can actually give you the links that would um, be clear and free and clear as well. So, um, the actual link, and this is one of an embedded. So what, this was an embedded video. What happened here was we went in to insert the media and use the embed code. On every YouTube code, at YouTube video, there's an embed code. You would simply copy that code and then paste it here, and then it would show up. So even though, Dr. Felder, this YouTube link isn't working, you can go out to YouTube, copy the embed code, and then be able to still insert it into the class. And then I will follow up with uh, information technology to see if something, I don't know if Canvas has disabled that feature or if we have, or if there's just simply a glitch with it. No, I talked to Canvas today. Okay. And they and they doing some research themselves. Okay. So they so, did not do it themselves. Okay. So I just need to ask someone in OIT if they disabled it, maybe. So between you talking to Canvas 
and me talking to information technology, hopefully we can get some answers on that. And you will let us know if they have done something or whatever. Yes, yes. Oh, Dr. White. Yes. Um, I just quickly, I found a great, for me, uh, asynchronous tool is using TED Talks. Uh, there's yeah. TED Talk Educator. And pretty much if you go to TED Talks and type in your subject area or area, they have a lot of different, you know, short 13 minute talks uh, from great minds across the world. And I develop a, you know, I use it to develop a discussion board prompts. I've used it for students to just answer what were the three key main points? What do you think about this issue? So I found that to be a good tool. That's a great suggestion. And Dr. Patterson Masuka, we may have to have you do a session on that using TED Talks for our faculty as an option. That Thank sounds you. good. <laughs> I like that idea. Uh, we're out of time now, unless you have some other specific questions. Um, I appreciate you taking some time today with us and learning about asynchronous instruction. Are there any exiting questions that you may have at this point? Job well done. Well, thank you. Coming from my former professor, I, I like that. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank good. you. You guys, we're just a, an email away. If you need anything, please let us know. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. White. This was a very important session. I think one of the most important, you know. Well, thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. You too. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.